Hey everyone, so that took a hot minute. Uh, been trying to let these sit for about 10 minutes in the queue so they can gear up for you guys. But then it seems to cause problems if I let it sit for a while. So I don't know what's going on. I don't know why it won't um, work for me that way. So let's see if we're working good. Yay, hello, Nathan. Hey, Damien. Good morning. So thank you guys for joining. Happy, happy Friday. So this has been about the longest, hey, JW, um, about the longest week of my life, I think <laughs> it feels like. So it was supposed to go to Florida and everything this week. So Monday morning, um, I canceled it all because... I finally gave in to the fact I had a virus. I had something wrong. Um, there had been vomiting. There had been low-grade fever. Um, so I went and got my COVID test. I went to the doctor, uh, checked me for strep. Everything was negative. Doctor said, you just have a stupid virus. Um, so I came home. I crawled in bed, stayed in bed till about 11 the next morning, <laughs> took a shower, crawled back in bed. Uh, it has been a long week. And then one of my children got it. Um, two other kids that had been over for playdates the weekend before also got it. Um, a lot of vomiting <laughs> going on with it and really feeling like poo. So I'm finally feeling a little alive today, a little rested, a little back at it. So, um, we'll see. We'll see. So there was no Florida, no Florida. <laughs> um, no sun-kissed Carrie coming home from relaxation, uh, but God knows better. He knew I needed to just chill and stay, and I forced myself to just be sick, guys. Uh, it's hard for me to not do work, not do all sorts of things, so I really just tried to force myself to relax and to rest. Um, so hello <laughs> and welcome. So I had some questions submitted by Kathy. Um, Man, my my viewership in St. Louis is strong. I'm not sure why in St. Louis. Maybe a lot of people dying down there lately with all the shootings and stuff. Man, St. Louis is vicious right now. Um, but you guys really send me a lot of good questions. Yeah, welcome. Hey, everybody. Hey, Amber. Hey, Erin. Thank you so much. Yeah, I am feeling better. So thank you. So, uh. But Kathy had sent me some questions specifically. She watches a lot of Dr. G and wondered some different questions. So I wanted to just hit on those this morning. Casey is asking though, I'm very interested in getting the fingerprint jewelry. Does a funeral home usually have fingerprints of the deceased? I won't say usually. Um, there are ones that will ask you before they fingerprint the deceased. There are some that will fingerprint everyone that comes into their care, not for jewelry purposes, but just for tracking and identification. That way, if anybody ever comes back, that's one way to identify who they were caring for. But um, you can call and check with them. You can always use a fingerprint from a discharge from the military, from any other tracking that someone has had their fingerprints done from too. But check with the funeral home and see if they have. If you know ahead of time, you can always ask the funeral home to print, fingerprint the person. So... Good morning. Good morning, you guys. Good morning. So, so good to see you guys. Um, so Kathy had asked, I know the funeral homes don't bring body bags to the hospice house. If a body comes from a hospital after an organ donation or the medical examiner after an autopsy, are body bags typically used? Yes. Like a hundred percent of the time I've never seen not a body bag used when someone comes from an organ tissue donation or an autopsy. The body is cut open at that point in different ways and will more likely be leaking out fluids because they don't suck out the blood, but the blood typically is there's areas opened that can be bleeding into. And so they will put them in a bag to kind of contain everything for transport. Um, so a body bag would be used in those situations. Yeah, Aaron, I that's I am so congested and I thought that's all it was. And then 
the vomiting and then everything else came. And I still have this weird allergy thing though, I think going on. Amber, that's a good, yes. Amber used her military records from of her husband to have some fingerprints made. Have I ever been sick right after an embalming? No, not at all. I'm usually hungry after an embalming <laughs> and I go eat. Um, Greg said, should the funeral home start fingerprinting the homicide victims in St. Louis to see if they are wanted for other homicides? You know, JW, it's not a bad idea to, I mean, that person's prints would then be on file somewhere. But I think if they are a victim of homicide, the medical examiner will most likely fingerprint them and put them in the system. I would think I would, that seems logical that they fingerprint them as part of their um, investigation, not so much even investigation, but their inspection of the deceased. Even if they don't do an internal autopsy, I would think that they would fingerprint them. And they typically do because they come back with black ink all over their hands. How do you handle the deceased that are HIV positive? The same exact way we handle anybody else. Um, if we know ahead, we may just work a little more cautiously, um, but exactly the same as anybody else. You don't know who's infectious with what. I mean, somebody could have HIV and nobody knows it. Somebody could have Crutchfield Jakob and nobody knows it and they die in a car accident. Um, there's all sorts of contagions that people carry that you don't know you have sometimes. Oh, Jen, how is it you're still sick and still look beautiful? <laughs> oh, Jen, you should have seen me. I will I will post some sicky pictures from this week. Um, I It has taken, this might be the first day I've worn makeup in like since Monday when I tried to act like I was feeling okay. <laughs> um, after autopsies, when they were removing, weighing, and dissecting organs, did they just toss them back into the cavity as one big bundle, try to paste them in the general original location, or toss them? They're all placed into a bag like a garbage bag disposal, um, biohazard bag of some sorts, um, and then placed back into the cavity after all the inspection of all the organs. So the person is a hollowed out cavity um, with the breastplate cut off, and that breastplate is then laid on top of the bag. The person has, sometimes they're stitched up decent. Sometimes it's just a couple whip stitches, which are just quick whipped around stitches. I need to do a video on stitches, don't I? I haven't done, or suturing, I should say. Um, I haven't done one on suturing. I need to. Maybe I can use like chicken breasts or something and cut and suture. I don't know. We're thinking out loud here, but I need to do one on that. Um, but that bag will then hold all the internal organs when they get to the point of the funeral home. What about the brain after an autopsy? Do they put it back in? So the brain never goes back into the cranium. Typically when we receive them, there'll be a huge wad of cotton or sometimes a towel that is placed inside the cranium to soak up some of the blood that's still um, draining out. And we will open, pull up the skin flap, pull off the cranium piece that has been cut. And then we can see inside the skull because when we inject up here, this part, the circulatory system that's up in your head has been cut typically by removing the brain. There's something called the circle of Willis, like Bruce Willis. Go Google it, circle of Willis. It's what's going on right in the middle. It's about this big of a section of where the arteries and the circulatory system all connects. And typically that is snipped when the brain is removed. And so we have to do kind of this thing where it's this part is good if there's two people. One person turns on the machine, the other person peeks with the skull, skull flap and uses um, little clamps to clamp off what's spraying because they'll typically go up and spray out <laughs> because it's the circle is broken often. But we want to keep it a closed system to get as much fluid inside each side of the head. So you kind of pick up the skull flap, clamp. If there's only one of you, you run up to the machine, turn it on, run back, pick it up, clamp, go turn it off, back on, clamp. 
um, to get the flow right. So it's a bit of a, a process when you are injecting up into the head when you're embalming someone that's been autopsied. Um, but it's so cool to see what is going on inside a head and that that is what is making your whole body function. It's for real, guys. Like if you step back and think about it, the biggest miracle in the whole world. It's crazy. So um going to hit some questions. My boyfriend died from an accidental fentanyl overdose. They took his prints right in the house. Greg has a JW. Do you hear David says Greg has a good idea. Tell Greg to call and tell somebody about that. <laughs> do you have any suggestions on how tips to help a loved one grieve, especially when you're grieving too? You have to take care of yourself first. Um, they talk about it the same as like you're on an airplane when the oxygen mask drops. You can't help someone put on their mask if your mask is not on. So you have to get yourself in a healthy, good place. And it really depends on who this other person is that you're talking about. If it's a child, then definitely you need to focus on you and make sure you're, get, you're in a really good zone. Then focus on you know, making sure that child is well as, as also, if it's another adult, you need to fully worry about you before you can really dive in and worry about somebody else. Because if you are in a ill phase of grieving where you are really struggling, you can't help somebody else and you can't tell somebody else how to grieve or how to get into a better place. They have to do it on their own, but you can be present, just being present for somebody is good. Hey, do you want to just come be and watch a movie? Hey, let's just grab dinner. Hey, let's just do something. You can't make their grief go away, but you can walk with somebody in grief while you're grieving. The hardest thing that most people want to do is talk too much because we're uncomfortable in somebody else's grief. So be silent. Let somebody talk if they need to talk. But if somebody else is grieving, you can't put your grief on them. They have enough on their plate. So you've got to find another person who's outside of the situation. And whether it's a therapist, a pastor, somebody else um, that is your counselor to you, that's who you have to find. But just being present is sometimes the best thing you can do as well. Have you ever had to use mortuary makeup on myself? Oop, I got to scan back up. On myself or others in case of emergency? I've not. I'll use like hairspray if I forgot my hairspray or something. But no, I've not had to put mortuary makeup on myself. How long do viruses and bacteria typically stay in a deceased body? It depends on what it is. Some of them become inactive pretty quickly. Some of them can um, stay active for weeks or even longer. Katie, no, I have never had to testify in a case before. I feel like I would go all like Judge Judy crazy. I, I feel like I would be so, so nervous, like I was on trial. Um, like you can't handle the truth crazy off the wall. I don't even know. That's what I picture is that I would, I would get all movie Hollywood up in my head and turn it into something it wasn't, who knows. But um, no, I've not had to testify in a case. If someone is a coroner <clears throat> case, we as nurses have to leave all tubes lying in place. They come into your care with them or does the coroner remove them? No, in that case with medical stuff, the coroner does remove the medical stuff um, or the medical examiner removes all the medical stuff before they come to us if they've had an autopsy. My mom lost her best friend. She's so broken and I feel like I should be stronger for her, but I'm feeling it too. Yeah, you know, and it depends, Maggie. Did your mom get the chance to say goodbye to her friend? Did they have a funeral? Did they have a service? Did they have a viewing? If some of those things were skipped, she might just be missing some of those things to help her kind of get to that next place. You might ask your mom, you know, hey, do you want to do a monthly? Let's at least schedule you and I going to dinner once a month or schedule for the next few months an activity like a wine and paint night, you know, like those wine and canvas or, you know, some activity that you two are going and doing something, 
You're not trying to be in place of anybody. You're not trying to um, forget about something maybe she used to do with her friend, but a new activity to look forward to, a new activity to create a social situation and experience for you guys. Just something new to be out for the next few months at least. Jen, you're so, so, you're so welcome. Robert saying he has a funeral director he knows that uses a body bag all the time, no matter the condition of the body. I would hesitate to say that he uses a full body bag that he's going to dispose of after because you have to dispose of them after. There's a lot of people that use pouches and it looks like a body bag on the cot, but it's a pouch that zips. It's not a body bag. A body bag is a one-time disposable and they're expensive. So for a funeral director to spend all that money every time they go to bring a deceased under their care, I would question that, Robert, just because of costs and everything. Hey, Tiffany. Mark, um, I may be going to California next month. So if I do, I'll see if Caitlin's available and try and do another video or at least something. Jane, when a body is exhumed after it's been embalmed, how can medical examiners determine cause of death after the use of a trocar? I would think it would do so much damage to the internal organs. You're right. It can. However, some of the condition of those organs is still going to be there. You're going to, and like if there's some blood clots up inside the, in the lungs, those are still going to be there typically embedded in the lungs, there's still going to be some things that they can find. They can still do testing of some tissue depending on the embalming. So there are things they can still look for. They can still look for different trauma on the body, bruising, things like that. So they can still look for things. Eileen, we do not reuse body bags. We're not supposed to. What hairspray do you typically use in the funeral home? I can imagine you would use super stiff stuff like Aquanet. Oh, yeah. Um, aerosol. Aerosol, aerosol, aerosol is my friend um, because it goes on. You can, it goes on more uh, evenly. Uh, so to me, aerosol is the way like Aquanet or whatever aerosol um, way. And you want something pretty rigid. It's a one-time thing. It's not like they have to, they're in the wind or they're moving um, that you have to protect the hair, but you do have to defy gravity. Like if I lay down, my hair is all going to fall backward right now. Like I'm not going to get this effect if I'm laying down, but if I hold it in place with some hairspray, I can still get that. Definitely uh, a battle. Are COVID-19 bodies contagious after death? Yes. Very much so. Up to 90 days they've been found. Why are body bags different colors? They just come in different colors. I have a two minute video on body bags. So go check that two minute video out. Maggie, okay, so your mom just lost her friend uh, less than a week ago. The services are on Monday and Tuesday. So your mom's not even in grief yet. It takes two weeks for grief to settle in. Right now, she is in the shock and pain stage of losing somebody. Her going, the services, going through the services are going to be a good start to processing anything. So she's not even into grief and the, the big loss right now is the numb, foggy, just trying to let your brain convince your heart that this is all real stage. So this is just fresh and new right now. We're not even in grief yet. So just in about two weeks is where judge how she's feeling. You don't need to take care of your mom right now. Your mom is strong. She is capable. Just be with her and be with each other and hold each other during this. You don't need to fix what she's feeling right now. It's too raw and too new and too real for her and you as well. So just go through the motions right now. That's all you can do is go through the motions. There's nothing to fix right now or to, to do. Do I ever see ghosts walking around? I have never seen a ghost walking around. I've had some paranormal experiences where 
I see things out of the corner of my eye or certain things happen that I can't explain. Doesn't mean it's ghosts, just paranormal, meaning unexplainable. Um, welcome Linda live. So yeah. How do you embalm a body after it's been through an autopsy? Um, same way you just inject the, through the arteries, they're just going to be more exposed since you don't have the heart as your main engine. Essentially, you would have to go to the different parts of the body to inject. And then you treat the cavity, place it back in, suture everybody up, everything up. So, oh, Nicole had a great question. Nicole, if you're still on, place your question again. Um, because it for me to scroll back up through is kind of hard to go back and find questions at this point. So, Nicole, just replace your question. Um if I haven't answered it yet, would there ever be a reason why you could not bring a body into a church? Um, if the church doesn't allow, we've had during COVID that they won't allow bodies in the church if they're COVID positive or other situations. Otherwise, not really, unless we can't get them physically in because of doorways or things like that. Some little bitty country churches are hard to maneuver through doors and into spaces. So I would think those would be the only really reason that we couldn't do it. Yeah, I don't know her question. So I'll have to have you re post it. Do you embalm the removed organs? We treat them with fluids. We would pour cavity fluid like in the bag, seal up the bag and let it um, fester, <laughs> let it get treated while we're embalming the rest of the person, suck out the fluid and then put the bag back in. Some people will do, we call it shake and bake. Some people call it that. Um, or breading the viscera where you take out each organ, cover it in a paraformaldehyde powder, which means a uh, powdered form of liquid formaldehyde. And you kind of coat each organ and then place them back in the cavity. So embalmers do one of two ways there. What is the one thing you've learned on the job about a human body where you thought, wow, that's so cool? There are so many things. The human body is literally the coolest thing ever. What it does, I mean, it grows another person inside of it from a little sperm and a little egg. Like what? Um, the way that it, this isn't even from um, what I've learned at work, but I've seen it so much at work that if, something can't get enough blood to it, your body grows more arteries to support it. So like when I had gallstones, my gallstones were not passing. They were just accumulating in my gallbladder. I was getting very sick. I was starting to get um, almost septic in my gallbladder because I was just accumulating. When they went in, they found I had grown seven additional little arteries to my gallbladder to account for the size of it but my body had changed and morphed because I needed more blood flow. So I grew more arteries and I see this throughout. Sometimes when you go to raise the carotid, there's all sorts of funky things happening, or you see other areas where you raise vessels and you see some funky things happening because the body has grown what it needs. It's like if the highway has a big hole in it, it builds its own new highway. It's, your body is freaking amazing. So treat it well and treat it good. In the news, they are showing funeral pyres in India, but I read that a fire isn't hot enough to cremate. So what is happening to those bodies? A fire can be hot enough to cremate, it, depending on what you fuel it with. So as long as there's fuel to it or some kind of thing to it. It's going to burn the body down. It's not going to burn down a body like a retort will. A retort heat is built to burn and completely vaporize essentially the box that the person is in and everything else. So they're not going to be left with just 
the basics of cremation like we do. They're not going to have just the brittle bone left and everything else burned away. They're still going to have some of the wood there and all the other stuff there. And especially when they're running one person after another and doing these kind of mass cremations, essentially one after the next, they're going to have just an accumulation and they can pull off what they can, what's left of the body, but you're still going to have more content than you would in a retort like we see. Do you fill the body cavity with something after an autopsy? Does the rib cage collapse? The rib cage does not collapse. It is a very rigid, strong structure. Do you fill the body cavity with something? No, your internal organs in that bag fill your whole cavity up. We do have to fill up the throat because often the tongue is cut and taken out and you want to rebuild the Adam's apple and rebuild up this area of the neck. Otherwise, you're going to get this weird flat and you can see this. So if you go to a funeral and you know the person had an autopsy, check out their neck area. And if it's really flat, that means they didn't fill out the neck because that what is all up and inside here is typically stripped out and is, is kind of hollowed out. And so you've got to kind of refill this area out. Some people will use a really firm cardboard tube to stick in, and that gives a great structure to that space. So it just depends on the embalmer what they make use. Do bodies make any weird noises? You know, I don't, I can't even tell you the last time I've had a body even like expel a little bit of air when you roll them and stuff. It's been quite a while, but they do sometimes. Um, you know, if you work with more bodies, you're going to hear it more often. Um, I mean, I have friends that embalm five, six bodies in a day sometimes. Um, so they're going to run into some of those little nuances more often. When my father-in-law passed, I tried to lift his hands to place flowers. I couldn't make them separate at all. Is it normal for someone to be that firm? Sometimes embalmers kind of choose how firm they want bodies to be. And some people kind of rock them is what we would say is make them super firm by using high index fluids. We do that because we don't know how sometimes the body is going to respond. And if you use higher strength for every single body, you're going to get a more consistent preserved um, response from bodies because you could have somebody that's super firm and you come in the next day and they're loosey goosey because something inside of their body from a chemical, from a um, medicine or something they were using has neutralized the formaldehyde, but we don't know always going in. So there are all these things that we can't know. And so we have to kind of guess about, um, used to be a little bit easier, but now people are walking medicine cabinets, literally so much medication in people. And then also the chemicals you put in your body every day by choice with what you take in and eat and surround yourself with in your home and everything. So we combat all of that because it's all inside your body, inside your tissues. If someone opts to do a viewing before cremation, is the body embalmed? If the funeral home requires embalming for a public visitation, then yes. You have to still authorize it, though. Any advice for someone leaving for more choice science this August? Thanks for being you. Um, just take the experience for what it is. Make sure you have been exposed to the field before you go to school so you don't invest a lot of money in something that's really not a right fit for you. If they have a flame powered by natural gas or propane, would the funeral pyre burn the body more completely? More than likely, because you can control how hot it's going to be at that point. You know, wood, you can only control so much. Once you get it hot enough, as long as you keep, you know, embers going or charcoal. I mean, think of a grill. Think of any fire that you have made yourself. Can you consistently get it hot enough to a solid temperature without having to put new cold wood back on or put lighter fluid on it to get it hot again or something. So it, that it, there's such a fluctuation there. Oh, 
Oh, Black Travel Brogy, you're welcome. Does the body look the same after 10 years? No way to know. There, not enough people have been dug up after 10 years on any study done on it. Do I have another person with me when embalming? Just the deceased. Nobody else. Is a higher concentration needed for chemo patients? Not specifically. No, not specifically. But chemo patients take a wide range of other medication while they're getting chemo as well. So there's not just one version of chemo. There's multiple versions with multiple medications with multiple, like some take Zofran, some don't. Some take a cannabis, some don't. Some are, you know, you've got all these variables with it. When someone passes, what is the family responsible for and what is the funeral home responsible for legally? Kiana, that's a huge question. Can you narrow in on one area of what you're talking about? If you get a body with staph infection from a hospital, do you handle it differently from a non-staph cadaver? Uh, cadaver is a word for somebody donated to medical science. So that would be corpse or body or something, not cadaver there. I like good terminology, guys. Um, no, I mean, if we know that they have, let's say, MRSA, or we know they have C. diff, or we know they have something super contagious going in, we may use a higher level of PPE protection, personal protective equipment, where some funeral directors don't wear respirators or head coverings or goggles, if we know they're contagious at a certain level, we may wear more of that kind of stuff. Um, I wear goggles because I've been sprayed before in the face and I refuse to get sprayed again. Once you get sprayed with poop once, never again. Um, once you, you know, breathe in certain things once, yep, never again. Once you get it all over your hair once, yep, never again. So, you know, it just depends on the personal embalmer's choice. I don't have a time frame of how long it would cremate by using firewood. And it depends how much wood. What was your, did you have another catalyst for the fire? Um, how hot is the wood? How big is the body? What are they wearing? Are they in something? Too many variables. Hey, Holly, have you seen funeral homes use volunteers like people who are retired and wanting something to keep busy or people who are disabled and unable to work but could volunteer a couple hours a week? Why would you ever volunteer? These are paid positions. You should not volunteer to do this type of work ever. I don't care if you're disabled or older or anything. I know many, most part-timers at funeral homes are older retired people and you get paid well or you get paid. It depends on the funeral home. I know a lot of disabled people, I guess that you would call disabled, who work at funeral homes in wheelchairs, crutches, whatever, um, hearing loss, sight loss, work at funeral homes, full paid jobs. So there's no reason to ever work for no pay. Don't do it. Your honesty is absolute best policy. Thank you. I'm going to be like, some people may not like what I say and that's fine. I'm going to be very honest and I'm not trying to be unkind with my words ever. Um, but I'm going to correct people and I'm going to tell the truth. That's what you can always <laughs> count on. And I'm not going to be crazy off the wall or anything, but I'm going to tell the truth. How do you greet a family when doing a removal from a home? Um, I just walk in and I introduce myself. I kind of figure out who everybody is and I ask them to show me where their loved one is. And I like to talk to the family where the loved one is. So we can, I can have a better conversation. I don't want to ignore the fact there's a dead person in the house or the space. I go to where they are and talk to the family there. That person was important enough, especially if it's at a home to bring them home. Like let's have them in part of the conversation sort of thing. I mean, what does the family have to provide the funeral home legally? Well, legally they don't have to provide anything. They can abandon the body and not do anything. Um, but the family needs to provide death certificate information if they're willing. They need to pay if they're willing. Otherwise, it gets turned over to the state and they don't get a say with what happens to the person. So um, it just depends on the situation. Have I ever cried when embalming someone? 
Um, not while, no, I've cried right before and I've cried after, um, but not during, during I'm focused and I'm doing, going through the steps, um, autopilot, let's say. If the body is contagious, are they after embalming and ready for viewing? Yes, they can still have contagion in them, but we do everything we can. Like with COVID, we're going to try to sanitize the nose and the mouth, which is where that's going to come out of. We bathe the body. We embalm very strongly um, with strong fluids. So we try to cut out all of the contagion every which way we can. So they're not as contagious, but we can't say with a hundred percent certainty that they're not contagious, but we do everything we can. How do I handle the fluids leaking again in the mausoleum my dad is in? I've tried to discuss this with the cemetery, but it's still not fixed. Um, the, all you can do is, is approach them and find out. If not, then you can call the health department and report it and say, listen, at the cemetery, there are what appears to be bodily fluids running out of one of the mausoleums. They are not fixing it and cleaning it up. And it is a health risk to me and anybody else visiting this mausoleum. So you could try to go that route, but go in and stand and physically see if you can get somebody to come look at it with you and ask for what date it will be fixed by. Um, be aggressive, but kind, be not bitching about it, but asking for safety and a response time of when they are going to fix it by. So it can be costly and it can be a huge, um, event. And if they're super busy at the cemetery, they may not be able to get to it right away. They could at least come clean the outside of the mausoleum off though, you know, the face plate, the face part of it so that's not out there. But if they don't are not taking it seriously, I would call the health department because they could then respond and hopefully get a little probing going on. Um, if a body needs to be buried quickly and you get a situation where you want it to rapidly liquefy versus preserve, what do you do? Um, then you use uh, alkaline hydrolysis and you go through what would be called water cremation to a lot of people. That's going to liquefy as quick as you can. Um, but otherwise, you just wrap in a shroud and bury directly. Are you worried about the high rate of cancer with funeral workers? I'm thinking it's the chemicals used. I mean, formaldehyde is a carcinogen. It, it is a gas. Formaldehyde is not a fluid. It is a gas that is put into a fluid vehicle for us to use for preservation. So this gas is out and in the air. We try to control it as much as we can. OSHA controls it. We regulate it. But it is still something that is breathed in in the embalming room and around us all the time. I know many funeral directors who have throat and esophageal type cancers, but they are also a generation that didn't use respirators and even gloves, <laughs> some of them. Um, so it's also about knowledge and protecting ourselves when a lot of funeral directors just say, ah, F it, and they don't wear the protective gear that they could be wearing. So it's also some personal choice. The PPE is there, whether they're choosing to wear it or not is up to them. But there is high risk of cancer in everything. There's as much formaldehyde around your home and in and around your vehicle and everything else you do too. So we definitely are exposed a little more to certain chemicals, but we're all exposed to chemicals every day too. Have I ever embalmed a body that is still warm? Oh yeah, many, many, many. Um, you know, within an hour or two of death even, which is always super creepy. And I kind of hold my breath a little when I'm making an incision just because what if, but um, you also can just tell they're dead, um, that they're not there. So yeah. Yeah, Robert, you, do, you can volunteer at funerals like through your church and stuff. That's a lot of volunteering. Um, every... Typically, most people at the church are volunteering their time to be there for a funeral. So that's a different scenario. 
How is a body handled for a deceased that shot himself in the head? What is fine for the autopsy? I don't know what that question, what is fine for the autopsy mean? Well, it shot that yourself in the head. You have a million variety of what that head could look like from a handgun to a shotgun to a rifle, all different scenarios where you can't even tell the person shot themselves that you can barely find an entry hole. You can barely find trauma. They just look dead to no head left. Um, so it's quite the wide variety of what that person could look like. Is it true that it costs money to hold a body in a morgue? Um, it can be if you want an extended hold period. Yes, you may be charged a per day storage fee because they're taking up space that you may need. If you say, let's say you're a small funeral home and you have a two drawer cooling unit and you have somebody that wants to be held for a month because the family is going on vacation or they're doing whatever, that month of being in that cold storage is taking a space that another body might need. So you paying $50 a day or whatever the per day storage fee is, is not unheard of. And it's legal as long as it's on the general price list. Um, you need to get your mortuary school degree. How many years? It's about three or four years with your prerequisites, your mortuary school, and your apprenticeship. So if you figure like three, four years, that's about how long it is. It is a lot of everything. You have to do psychology. You have to do social work. You have to do religion. You have to do public speaking, art, um, debate, uh, psychology, dare I say that one, and biology, anatomy, accounting, math, and then you drive into laws and embalming law and anatomy, chemistry of embalming and all these more specific type things to deal with funeral directing. What do we do with burned bodies? It depends on the level of burned. So some of these questions, guys, are so general, I could have a deceased that has like just a little surface burning and there's no difference. Or I could have a body that is completely charred down to the bone. So can you see that some of these questions, there's such a huge range of what the answers could be depending on the scenario. So um, I'm happy to answer questions, but I would have to answer probably 10 different scenarios with how do we deal with the burned body because of the variety, second degree burns, third degree burns, you know, all huge variables. Um, they do embalm newborns. That's not true that they don't embalm newborns. Newborns are embalmed um, if you're going to have a funeral and stuff. So that's not a true statement. Thank you for answering my question. Does your job ever give you anxiety? It gives me anxiety worrying that I forgot something like, oh my gosh, did I call that place? Is that going to be taken care of? What's going to happen with this? Is the family going to like how they looked? Definitely anxiety with that. I'm a high anxiety person anyway. Um, I worry about everything. Like I run worst case scenarios for literally everything, including doing a live video. Like is my audio good? Is the chat going to be there? You name it. Um, so yeah, I always have anxiety. Yes, you can embalm a multiple stab wound victim. I mean, they could have 100 stab wounds on them and you can still embalm. Are bodies in cold storage frozen or just kept cool? They are not frozen. In America, we are regulated what our temperatures of our coolers have to be if there's a deceased inside them. They have to be between, um, I think it's 35 and 45 degrees. So we can't freeze a body. A medical examiner can do a whole different temperature range and they can freeze a body. We cannot. So we are very regulated. We don't want a frozen body that doesn't benefit us. It hurts some of the cells for us to be able to embalm if we do embalm. Um, so we keep bodies cool at a cooled level, um, but we don't freeze. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, Karen. Thank you. Oh my gosh, guys, lots of rambling craziness. Let me answer this one question too. I had someone asked about um, at a later date, 
During the pandemic, a very common line in obituary states something about a celebration after the COVID threat is no longer an issue. How will that be scheduled? Should we involve the funeral home? What are the steps to contact the cemetery and monument company? Well, that's really up to the family. Um, it depends on what their at a later date is gonna look like and what kind of services or gathering they may wanna have. And it'll depend on if they've paid for and set something up with the funeral home already. They just have to call and reschedule it later. But the funeral home is not going to keep calling and bothering the family and saying, do you want to schedule? Do you want to schedule? Do you want to schedule? It's really up to the family to say, hey, we're ready to schedule or, hey, it's time for this. Can you help us call the cemetery and stuff? So the funeral home is there to help and to assist, but it's up to the family to really take the steps. I know that some funeral homes have circled back and called all of the service at a later date families, but it's still up to the family and their comfort level and their restrictions in their state. Right now, we are still at 25 people for funerals in Michigan. We're not opened beyond that. So we're pretty regulated down to a really small number at this point with 25 people. So um, it just depends on the state and what their regulations are. All right, one or two more questions, guys. Without giving the state, have you encountered some absolutely weird rules for different states? Um, that's a good question, Dustin. I haven't encountered enough state laws. As I'm going through and as I do all of these type of things, I do encounter some different things, but nothing that I would say is wacky or off the wall yet. Not that I found. I think it's ludicrous that alkaline hydrolysis is not legal in every state yet. Um, that's ludicrous to me and weird. But... Other than that, nothing specific when it comes to things. I'm sure as I get more exposure to different states and different laws, but every state has completely different laws. It is the weirdest thing to me. I don't understand why we can't have one national set rules and laws and licensure and everything. It would make everything so much easier. Can you embalm a person, a victim of a car accident, which the person was crushed? Absolutely. A hundred percent. I started watching your Watts video. In your opinion, was Shanann's case able to be an open casket kind of case? Um, just for the decomposition factor and smell, more than likely not for the public. But I have no idea what she looked like. Honestly, you can take two people in scenarios like that and they could decompose completely different. Was she face down, face up, on her side, on her back? Was there any animals that came out? You could have one setup where some, the animals came and found the person and you had some, you know, tissue eaten or more larvae activity, you know, all these variables. So I honestly don't know. I would guess, though, just because of de decomposition, that she may not have been able to be viewed for public, for sure, for smell reasons. But beyond that, I it would be just guessing. If bodies are only kept at a certain temperature and they're stored for a couple of months, does the body deteriorate? Definitely. Decomposition still happens. Co being cold doesn't stop the tissue from breaking down. The body's going to get soft and the tissue is going to get all broken down inside. The vasculature still decomposes. It just does it a little bit slower. So it's going to be very hard. Once you pull somebody out of cold storage and warm them up, that body quickly starts to try to catch up to the decomposition rate at which it should be. Um, but that tissue is going to be super soft, super mushy. Um, it's a really weird texture to even explain. Um, but it's not good. It's not good at all. So they can still have skin slip. They can still be green. They can still um, have a lot going on with them. Tiffany, it depends. The cemeteries can set the regulation based on the state level at 25 right now, um, or a cemetery is not doesn't care because it, de it depends, and it depends what the funeral home. The rules are so gray area to me because Okay, it's a funeral. A funeral is regulated to 25 people. However, the outdoor laws are different than a funeral law. So if we do a graveside, do we follow what an outdoor gathering law is or do we follow a funeral law? Who knows and who's regulating it? I don't even know. Um, so it's 
yeah, gray area. One more question. Robert, thank you for the happy Mother's Day comment. Allah says, or Ella, when you take care of a body, do you in the back of your mind think about not hurting it? Not in the way you might be saying, like when I'm cleaning their nails, I'm not worrying. I'm poking too far. Um, when I'm making incision, I don't think if I'm hurting them. No, none of that. I'm not going to drop them though. I'm going to worry about hurting that body by dropping it and doing some more damage to it. But I'm not worrying about them being in pain at all. Not even a little bit. No. Nope. So, well, thank you. Good morning, Pastor Jack. Welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for joining. If you don't subscribe, click the subscribe button and make sure you check out another video. Um, thank you for joining and I will see you guys soon. Bye.